Welcome to Private Club Radio, the industry's first and only program dedicated to education, news, events, trends and announcements. Broadcasting from Tampa, Florida, ladies and gentlemen, here is your host, Gabriel Aloisi. Thanks for joining me once again on Private Club Radio. Today's guest is Peter Nanula, Chairman of Concert Golf Partners. We're discussing all things capital on the show today. You'll learn what Peter calls the death spiral of private clubs and how you can avoid it, how to put a value on what a club is worth, and we'll discuss the alternative solution Concert Golf provides clubs looking to get out of debt and make capital improvements. Before we bring Peter on, a few announcements for you. The National Club Association's webinar series continues with what they call the power of the favorite place status. It's going to happen Thursday, April 28th at 2 p.m. Eastern. This installment is presented by the McMahon Group. You'll learn how to maximize the experience level in every amenity area of your club, The program is free for NCA members and $35 for non-members. You can register for the webinar at nationalclub.org. And the Florida chapter of the CMAA will hold their 2016 Club Management Summit at the Breakers in West Palm Beach July 31st through August 3rd. They've got a great lineup of speakers planned, including yours truly. I'll be giving a presentation on millennials and how to attract them and retain them in your club. And I'm just one of many great educational pieces you're going to hear at that summit. For more information, please visit flcmaa.org. Are you searching for members? Are you looking to drive revenue to every department of your club? With Course Driver, you can. Course Driver is a custom smartphone application designed specifically for your club. Visit CourseDriver.com to schedule your demo today. This episode of Private Club Radio Show is brought to you by Wildstyle Media, an award-winning media firm and a leader in high-end audio and video production. Wildstyle Media offers full-service media production, post-production, and creative solutions for your company or brand. Contact us today at wildstylemedia.net or call 813-358-6588 today. My guest today is Peter Nanula, chairman of Concert Golf Partners, a well-capitalized group that owns and operates country clubs nationwide. Mr. Nanula bought Arnold Palmer Golf Management in 1993 and served as CEO through 2000, during which time he built the company into a leading owner-operator of golf courses nationwide with 30 courses and 2,000 employees. He's also affiliated with Freestone Capital Management, a $3.5 billion wealth management and asset management firm. Mr. Nanula was previously an attorney at O'Melveny and Myers, and he earned his undergraduate and law degrees from Harvard University. How are you doing today, Peter? Excellent. Good to talk to you, Gabe. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. Peter, can you tell us a little bit about your history, how you transitioned from a career as an attorney, and how you came to acquiring Arnold Palmer Golf Management? Yeah, sure. Yeah, as a young lawyer, I don't think you're thinking about getting in the golf industry. <laughs> um, but I, I left lawyering to work on the other side for clients who were in the investing business, which was a lot of fun. So investing in companies. And then some of the folks from some of the leading companies in our golf industry came into our office looking for capital. And I was the young guy that was tasked to learn about the industry and see if we should invest in them. Didn't end up doing it, but uh, I left the firm to go partner up with Arnold Palmer, which was really an honor and a chance of a lifetime. Uh, and his company was a was a well-regarded company in our industry, but small. And so my thought was, let's bring some capital to it. Or let's bring some top-notch people to it. And we made about 30 club acquisitions over the next seven years. It was quite a ride. Wow. Um, so that was the transition. And then, um, you know, ultimately got back into the business here about five years ago with Concert Golf Partners. Yeah. So I was going to ask you that. How did that idea or plan come about? Yeah. You know, it's funny. I was out of the business for nine or 10 years. Um, and then, of course, the recession hit in 08, 09. And uh, a bunch of people that I knew from the industry were calling me saying, boy, there's you know, a lot of carnage in the industry. The banks are gone. Um, there's no capital. And that's sort of an area where I've spent a lot of my career in. And so I looked at it and boy, there were a lot of clubs that needed help. 
Sure. And so I assembled a pool of pay, patient capital so that I could help to recapitalize some of these clubs. And, you know, so far, so good here. Uh, 12 clubs in, all of them needed capital, and it's really helped the clubs. Well, I'm a member, as you know, of Carrollwood Country Club, and uh, I've seen the improvements and then the things that have taken place just in the last uh, three years or so since you guys have uh, been a part of that. And it's it's dramatic, and it's everybody's very happy of what Concert Golf's doing there. Oh, well, that's good to hear. So how does Concert Golf actually work? How do you work with clubs? Right. So typically, the way we get involved is a, is a private club, often a member-owned private club, has got some debt that they borrowed in order to do golf course improvements or clubhouse improvements years ago. And the payments to your bank get kind of stubborn. They never go away. It's kind of like you think you're going to pay off that loan, but you never really do. (laughs) So here's a club that's paying, you know, half a million bucks a year out to their bank. And the problem is that those payments to your bank start to choke off your ability to reinvest in new things at your club three, four, five years later. So we call them up. And we say, hey, we'll pay off your bank loan and we'll fund those capital projects that you're thinking about. And we'll keep the club private. And then the topper is, you'll never have any member assessments again. And usually there's a long pause and the board member says, wait a minute. (laughs) What's the catch? That sounds too good to be true. (laughs) Right. Right. And so that's normally what we do. So it's it's really good clubs, uh, upscale private clubs that have a little bit of debt or a little bit of capital projects they want to fund. And they really just never even considered this alternative. So when you're looking for an investment or an acquisition like this, you know, what, what are some of the, the, the things you're looking for? Are there any telltale signs that make it a good fit for concert golf? Yeah. So we, we focus like your club, Carrollwood country club in Tampa. We focus on larger clubs, meaning, you know, at least two or 300 members, at least, four or five million a year in revenues uh, in major metro areas. So you're not going to find us in far out of the way, remote rural places where there aren't very many people. Uh, But in major metro areas, bigger clubs, and usually if they have either a little bit of debt or some capital projects they're thinking about, or another category we can talk about is um, membership refunds. A lot of times you join a club, you spend 10, 20, 50 grand to join, And somebody, when you joined, promised you you'd get your money back when you left. And the problem is, if they owe Gabe 50 grand when Gabe leaves, and the next new member who joined pays 12 grand to join, there's a negative cash flow problem there. Sure. So sometimes it's member refunds that we can solve also. I want to ask you a little bit how you do that. Um, but before we actually go into that, so there, you know, there's 2,500 member owned clubs out there in the US. Over 50% of them have unsustainable debt loads. What's the source of that, and what's the solution you guys offer? Yeah, great question. Uh, Most people just don't realize it. Uh, I was talking to a journalist the other day, and the estimate we've come up with is that the the private club industry needs probably about a billion dollars of equity capital in order to get right-sized. In other words, there's a lot of member-owned clubs, like I said before, that have borrowed from their local bank because they were doing a project. and The local bank obliged them at one point, but those payments never went away. And now the club really has difficulty paying it off. Well, they need equity. Well, how does a member-owned club get equity? Well, you can pass the hat amongst 300 people called an assessment. Right. Normally, when you do an assessment, 5 or 10% of your members quit. They just look at it and say, wait a minute. I signed up for the initiation fee. I signed up for the monthly dues. But I didn't really sign up for getting a surprise bill in the mail every Christmas. Right. So am I really using the club that much? Do I really have all this discretionary income? Maybe I'll just quit because I'm not using the club as much. Well, what happens when you're down 5 or 10% number of members next year? Well, you have less people to spread the bill across. So the dues go up higher, the assessments go up higher, and you get sort of this downward spiral. So anyway, a lot of, a lot of clubs have an amount of debt that means they need some equity. And I think assessing the members is increasingly painful. So a new injection of equity capital is what we do. We invest and pay off their debt and put capital of our own into these capital projects. 
I've heard you refer to it as the private club death spiral. So I love that term. <laughs> it's really true. I mean, it's not a concept that we invented. I've heard it from board members at clubs. You know, most board members at clubs are very successful business people in their own lives. And they volunteered to sit on the board of their member-owned club, right? Um, so they know what business looks like. They know how to capitalize a company. They know when too much debt is too much debt. And then they go to their club and they kind of volunteer to go to these meetings and help out. And normally one of them will call me up and say, geez, we'll never get rid of this bank loan. Tell me what you do. And then, you know, we introduce them to our concept. We introduce them to board members at our other clubs and say, why don't you call these other people? See if their fact pattern was similar to yours. They have a nice conversation. And usually it's pretty unanimous. We need to do this. I don't know why we didn't do this five years ago. Right. That kind right. Of thing. Sure. So that's a question I have for you. You know, there's there's a disconnect there, right? So these are all very successful business owners sitting on a board. Why don't boards run like a business? <laughs> ah, well, that's a big softball question. Uh, you know, it's it, you're right. It's very successful business people who absolutely know how to run companies and be on boards. Um, but the structure of a the structure of a member owned club, I think causes a lot of the problems, right? The bylaws of most of these clubs were written 50 or 100 years ago. Right. Somebody wrote down a charter and said, listen, Gabe, we need to have 15 of us on the board. Well, how are we going to rotate the board so that people don't have to spend too much of their time? Well, how about every year we have elections and nominations and Gabe can only serve for three years and he can only be president for one year. So you have this rotating series of people that come on the board so that the volunteering amongst the members is somewhat you know, equally distributed. The problem is not a single person on the board knows anything about golf club management. None of them came out of the industry like I have or even like you have. They have a very successful life as a lawyer, banker, doctor, insurance person. They don't have any expertise at buying John Deere triplex mowers, right? They don't right. know that much about food and beverage. They've never done this before. So. They learn. So they'll start researching, go to these meetings, go to your website, go to mine, talk to people. And then about a year in, the guy starts to sort of know what he's talking about and make a little better decisions. And guess what happens? He's turfed out. His term is up. Right. So the institutional knowledge of how to run a country club leaves every November. It's crazy. And so... It's really quite predictable that all but the top, top echelon of clubs, Baltus Roll, LA Country Club, et cetera, those people will never need capital or help like this. But 80% of them have a structural setup here that's going to lead them to need some kind of help at some point. And we just like to meet them before the death spiral becomes too acute. Right. So a lot of the setups are their their nonprofit 501c7 co-ops. And, you know, that was, like you said, 50 to 100 years ago that that was put in place. And it's just kind of always the way it's always been. Is there something they should do to reconsider? Absolutely. Right. So they're, they're, they're mostly nonprofit 501c7s. Uh, they've always been that way. No one questions it. It's a little bit like your local homeowners association board. I go to the meetings of my local HOA because I live in a little community with 240 homes. They were in Southern California. Yeah, those meetings, I think everyone's pretty well-intentioned. Mostly people just care about their own house and the flowers as you drive into the gate of your community or what have you. But <laughs> sure. it's not a business. It's, it's set up as a, as a sort of a talking session where 50 people sit around and gab about their community. Well, member-owned club boards may have more serious intentions that people are trying to legitimately help. But again, why would you set up something where nobody on the board is a professional at that business? You just wouldn't. Like the board members at every company I've been an investor in or the CEO of, all the board members are experts in that subject. That's why they're on the board, right? <laughs> yeah. So what they really should do first off is do a little research on the industry. Talk to people like yourself and some of the guests you've had on this show. There's a bunch of people who are kind of the known experts in the different disciplines. And then they should probably research different capital structures for their company. I mean, you can't get to the details that you talk about on your show with people about food and beverage or growing membership or the kind of operating details until you solve the big picture, which is how are you structured? Where's your capital coming from? 
who's making decisions strategically at your club. That's kind of the threshold level question these boards should be asking themselves. Oh, absolutely. So walk me through what it's like when concert golf comes into one of these distressed clubs. Is there a roadmap you guys take? How do you go about it? Well, first, let me correct you. Not always distressed clubs at all. Okay. Uh, One of our most recent clubs is a club in Raleigh, North Carolina called McGregor Downs Country Club. About a 50-year-old member-owned club. Great golf course that hosts USGA qualifiers and a you know, really nice course. And they had about $1 million in debt. Not a big deal for a club with revenues of 5 or $6 million a year. I think that's, that's really not a problem. Sure. But they had a bunch of capital projects that they were thinking about, somewhere between wish list, nice to have, and, so, and, and, and need to have. Somewhere in there was a list of projects they probably should tackle in the next five years. And they were having lots of meetings about how to pay for all that. So we got introduced through a couple of people that were either their lawyer or their accountant or a consultant who had been in there to help them. And uh, they said, well, tell us what you do. Anyway, long story short, they formed a committee of their board to do develop the master plan, the strategic plan that most member-owned clubs do. We've got to raise dues this amount for the next 10 years. We got to do a series of assessments to pay for all this. And we got to borrow more from our bank. That's the sort of normal go-to plan for a club. And then they formed another subcommittee to research independent kind of outside capital partners and whether that could be an option. So people called Club Corp. They called us. Mm-hmm. They called a local group that has bought or managed some country clubs. Anyway, they did a bunch of analysis. And at the end of all that, the committee recommended and the board voted unanimously 15 to zero. We needed to have this capital partner. We've chosen Concert Golf Partners uh, hands down as the best fit for us. And why wouldn't we? They're going to pay for all this stuff. We're not going to have any debt. Our dues are going to stay exactly where they are now. They've guaranteed in writing no assessments ever again. And the club will always remain private. And they're going to manage the club on a day-to-day basis and report to an advisory board of us. Like, why wouldn't we do this? And they were worried that this would be a big change for their members after 50 years. What about loss of control? And this has always been a club we... They went out to the members, you know, your bylaws at private clubs usually require the members to ratify any big decisions like debt or a a transaction like this. And they thought it would be 50-50 or 60-40 and it would be a really turbulent kind of a vote. It was 93% in favor. Once the the members heard what the basic objective was, it was a no-brainer. They were kind of shocked that the members, without any distress, with a very low amount of debt. Remember, this is a club that had grown its membership for five consecutive years. This was not a club in trouble. They were just trying to decide, what's the best way to capitalize and run our club and keep it the way we like it, hands down? So if you go and talk to those people on the board or the members today, they'll tell you, geez, we should have done this five years ago. So that's a, a big distinction you're making there. You guys aren't like a Troon or a Club Corp. You're not a club management company. Correct. Most people get confused about that, right? So there's probably 100, maybe 200 companies that are what you would call third-party managers, third-party golf management companies that for 100 to 200 grand a year, you can have come in and run your club. What does that mean? We'll sign a contract with you for a year or three years or five years. You manage our general manager and our food and beverage director and our grant. You you guys do all that. Get the training manuals and the accounting. and You guys do that. We'll just come to board meetings. We'll talk to somebody from Troon who gives us a report that's five or ten pages long. And then we don't have to deal with our staff, really. That's what third-party fee managers do. They don't have any capital. They don't fix the capital structure of your club. They don't invest in any of their own money, so they're not really incentivized to make the club successful. They're incentivized to get paid a fee to run the club better for you on a day-in and day-out basis, which is a good thing for a lot of clubs. What we do is we put in the capital to fix your whole club capital structure, and because we have millions of our own dollars invested, we have a serious incentive to grow membership, 
make the food better, make the golf course better, and make the members happy. And so it's quite a different proposition than just managing for a fee. Sure. So most clubs only fund projects when things are going good, right? So when the times are tough, the wallets and the pocketbooks, they start to tighten. Why is that so dangerous? Yeah, exactly. This is this is what I think is the Achilles heel of the private club industry is this sort of boom and bust of funding capital projects, right? So if you think about hotels, uh, where you are in Tampa, you've probably got a Hyatt and a Weston and a Hilton and all of those in downtown Tampa somewhere. Sure. Those, those hotels are competing to get you and me to book in there, right? And so every year, whether it's the water slide for the kiddies or the new fitness room or, you know, redoing their rooms or making the food better with a new chef or let's have music on Friday nights, all that stuff. They're in the hospitality business. And if they're not out doing the hotel across the street, you're probably not booking there, right? So think about clubs. As another hospitality industry, we got three to 500 members at your club, Carol Wood Country Club. If we're not making your lives really happy, better golf, better food, better service, more events, scotch club, wine club, beer club, you know, we'll try to figure out what you're a member of at Carol Wood. Sure. You know, if those things aren't getting better, you're just going to vote with your feet and go join some other club down the street. Well, what most member owned clubs do is, when we sell a bunch of new memberships this year at ten grand a piece, hey, we got some cash coming in, and we 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 keep track of it as a separate line item. That's the money we can use to invest in the new water slide or the new fitness expansion. Well, this year we've been kind of down in selling new memberships, so we don't have a lot of initiation fee revenue. So we're not going to spend any money on our club. Well, guess what happened? The club across the street just did all these great improvements. Everyone's talking about it. Any new prospects that are moving to Tampa or thinking about joining a country club this year, they're going to join that club, not yours, because your club is now three years in, hasn't really done anything nice at the club, and you're losing new membership prospects to those people. So what we do is, with the debt gone, right, and a bunch of capital improvements that we fund up front, we also create a capital improvement reserve, rain or shine, whether new members are joining or not, Every single month, we fund into a separate bank account for this stuff so that our general managers, who are like CEOs of our clubs, they're constantly making the decision to just invest in their club where they need to so that they can outcompete the other clubs in their market. We call it continuous capital project funding. It's really critical, and member owned clubs should try to do the same if they can. Right. You alluded to it before, but Debt's basically virtually gone from the club industry. There used to be these specialty club lenders out there who'd finance clubs' capital project needs. Why do you think those lenders fled, and where where does that actually leave clubs today? Yeah, no, great question. That's that's really what got me back in the business five years ago is that Textron Financial and GMAC and GE Capital used to supply something like $2 billion in mortgages, you know, loans, just like you buying your house. Um, they used to be the main lenders to the club industry. They all left after the recession for different reasons, right? GMAC was part of General Motors. General Motors got taken over by the government, and so they stopped making loans, not just their golf clubs. And then GE Capital decided to shrink their balance sheet, right? So lending to country clubs shrank dramatically. Imagine $2 billion of loans just going away. Well, where are clubs going to get the money and where are people who could fix up clubs going to get the money? It isn't out there. You might get your local bank to do it, uh, but oftentimes they're not experts in club lending. They don't quite understand the sort of risks and the unique issues regarding country clubs. So they're not always the best fit either. Right. Anyway, so with those, with those banks gone from lending, what do clubs do? And so, frankly, they just need equity. So if the members could pass the hat, charge everybody 5,000 bucks and raise, you know, 2 or 3 million to do that next project, go for it. But a lot of clubs as I said before struggle with that. Another method that we've seen is something called a capital campaign, which is we're not going to assess all 300 of the members. We're just going to voluntarily ask people if you have a lot of money, if you'd like to kick in 5 grand 
it would really help us. And so it's more like your, your kid's school or your church or what have you, where people voluntarily put up some money, and it's more like a donation. They might get a promissory note that may get repaid, it may not, but the idea is those who can afford it pony up. Well, you can just see how both of those methods are tricky, right? You're tapping your own customers. Go back to my hotel example. Let's put a sign in the lobby of the Hyatt in downtown Tampa. Would you like to donate? Because if you guys put up enough money, we'll build a new fitness center at this hotel. Nobody wants to do that. They basically want to pay what it costs to have a room at the Hilton. And then they want to have a nice experience and they want to leave. You as a member of Carol, if we put up a sign in the lobby and said, hey, Gabe, how about you put up three grand because we're thinking about doing some cool stuff at your club. You're thinking, wait a minute, I'm a member. Why don't you do that? Right? <laughs> sure. And so it's much better for the owner operator of the club to have the money, put the money in like a hotel owner does and make it great. And the members can go back to just playing golf, eating having a good time with their friends. All right, Peter, so how do clubs actually place a value on themselves? How do you evaluate a club? Yeah, so this is an area of a lot of confusion. Um, I'll go and meet with club boards and in town hall meetings with a couple hundred members, and people will say, wait a minute, we had Toll Brothers or some home builder approach us and say our club was worth $30 million. So why won't you just pay us $30 million? And we all get a big check and go home. Sounds great. <laughs> it sounds pretty good, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, and and you know what I usually do is start with a show of hands. Hey, everyone, raise your hand if you would like your golf course to be bulldozed and have 300 homes put up here. Not a single hand goes up. So let's make sure we're all clear. Nobody wants to get rid of the golf course or your club. You all want to preserve the club as a fabulous country club. Yes, 100% in favor. Okay. So the idea of Toll Brothers or another home builder bulldozing your property for residential development for $30 million is not something anyone is interested in. Okay, glad we agree. So what's it worth as a club? If you're going to keep it as a country club, Gabe, you could have on your show uh, Jeff Wilson of CBRE or Steve Ekovich of Marcus and Millichap or Hilda Allen, and she could tell you that most country clubs trade for roughly one times their gross revenue if they want to stay as a country club, which means if your club has got gross revenues every year of about $6 million, your club is worth somewhere around $6 million, give or take. It's not worth 30 if you want to keep it as a country club. So that's what I usually talk to people about, and then they understand it. They do want to keep it as a club. Um, and then some people say, well, where's my equity? I joined... I paid 10, 20, 30,000, 50,000 to join. Am I not getting a check? And the answer is uh, no, because you've asked us to pay off all your debt. You've asked us to do all this golf course work and clubhouse work, and you add all that up, and it's equal to or more than one times gross revenues. And yet you want a check for your equity. Uh, there, there is no equity value there. What one member at one of these town hall meetings said it best. Uh, he said, what's the definition of equity in a country club? And he said, it's the right to be assessed. And <laughs> everyone laughed. Sure. And it was kind of the running joke because the truth is, in very few clubs in America, you actually get your 30 grand back someday. It's basically an entry fee. Somebody may have told you that you were going to get some money back someday. But the truth is, when I ask members, what do you really want? Do you want a check back so you can quit and go join some other club? Or do you love all your friends and the culture of your club and you just want your club to be fabulous forever? Right. And they always say, oh, yeah, no, that's what we want. We want the money going into our club so we can keep coming here, preserve it, and make it fantastic. And so that's what we do. It's, it's not a matter of you getting a check like a shareholder of IBM. So what do you see clubs using this money for? So the clubs that are proactive, and, and that's a distinction I always make. There's You have you know, proactive and you could be reactive. And the reactive clubs are the ones that are you know, clearly struggling a lot of the times. So these proactive clubs are clubs that actually want to take this capital and do something with it and improve their club. What are some of the highlights? What are some of the trends that you're seeing? Yeah. So um, as I, I think I heard Jackie Carpenter on your show recently 
talk about some of the improvements and the trends going on in the club industry, and we see the same activity. So, uh, you know, fitness has been a trend at clubs. So adding a fitness facility or taking the really small Marriott courtyard, you know, shoe closet kind of fitness facility and turning it into a real fitness facility Mm -hmm. has been a trend. And we've been doing that at a lot of our clubs. Casual dining. You'll see us and most clubs that are spending money on their clubs say, okay, we have the old formal dining place with the white tablecloth. Some of our older members still like that. But what people really like is something that feels more like the best restaurants in Tampa that have a more casual feel. People really like outdoor dining, right, where you might have some heat lamps. You might have some other uh, atmospherics. But the idea is you can kind of sit outside, watch people come in on the 18th green. Maybe there's a barbecue pit, and and it's just much more informal and casual. You can imagine sitting around with the kids. You can imagine three couples going to the club and eating instead of the old days where everything was formal and kind of stuffy. Right. That's that's losing sway. So those are some of the uh, more typical expenditures. A lot of times the pool is a center of life at a club. Sure. So putting in the water slide. And the little fountains for the kids to play. Boy, you should see the look on mom's faces when the kids are having a good time entertaining themselves. Now the moms want to go to the club and hang out. Dad's playing golf. Everybody's happy, right? Sure. Um, So it's those those kinds of things that we're doing at most of our clubs. Yep. You've got uh, bocce courts here at Carrollwood. That's my favorite feature. Uh, Yes. I'm an Italian. I like that game. So (laughs) I think it's a good way to sip some wine and and, and hang out with some people and and throw a ball into the court. You know, (laughs) it's kind of cool. It's not expensive. Like, think about what that little bocce court costs. Right. You and a bunch of people can sit around drinking, playing bocce, and just sort of having a good time together. Yeah. A couple of my bar tabs probably covered it. (laughs) There you go. So you're our kind of member. Um, all right. So, you know, we've talked a lot about negatives. Let's flip that, Peter. What sort of good policies and ideal ideologies uh, enable clubs to thrive and grow their memberships? Yeah, no, good question. So, you know, first, like I said, is continually reinvesting capital in your club because you have a well-funded capital reserve. That's the biggest one. Mm-hmm. Um, having a no assessments policy, whether you're a member-owned club or whether you're part of our system. Uh, really helps. When we talk to membership directors and general managers, you know, we ask them, and we have them in our own group, like at Carrollwood, right? Uh, what are the biggest obstacles you've got in selling a new membership? Or what are the biggest complaints you hear from your members? The biggest ones are uh, assessments. They hate that, right? Sure. That's the biggest turnoff. If a couple is coming to join a club and they hear about assessments, they go the other way. Mm-hmm. There might there might be an assessment. We had an assessment three years ago. That's a big turnoff. Yep. If the club has a bunch of debt, like I said before, that word gets around very quickly. People don't want to join a club that's got a big debt burden. Hey, what has happened to the dues the last few years? Well, generally it's you know up three or four percent, but last year we were up by ten or fifteen percent. We they raised them by fifty or hundred bucks. Wow, how did that happen? Yeah, people hate that. Um, another one is just streamlined decision making. One of the things we hear from our general managers is, "I love it here because I'm like a CEO. We have a game plan. Nobody's micromanaging me." And I don't need to go to 14 meetings with a bunch of board members to get something done. I just do it because I know my members would love bocce and Gabe will be out there drinking with his friends. And how much did it really cost? I had the money. I just did it. I literally don't even need to talk to anybody about it. Those are some of the things that make it really good for a membership director or a general manager is they sort of are CEOs. They have capital and they can respond to their members' needs rather than long processes of meeting with committees and board members and sort of playing politics at your club. There's no politics at our clubs. Just make the members happy. The answer is yes. That's nice. So what can clubs prepare themselves or what can they do to prepare themselves to look favorable to you guys or to maybe get that that investment that they need? I think the biggest thing is they don't really have to do anything special to prepare. I think the biggest thing, Gabe, is openness. Uh, 
uh, some board members we meet say, I'm calling you. I'm not sure we're a fit or we would ever do this or we would ever need this. But I feel like I have a fiduciary duty on the board of this club to check out what the options are. Right. So that's probably 5% of the people. I would say the other 95% sort of have their head in the sand and say, you know, we've been member owned for 97 years. Um, we have a lot of pride. Our club is very prestigious and exclusive. We'll get through somehow, but we're going to keep it private. And we're definitely not calling anybody outside. The biggest problem is a lack of openness and desire to learn about other options. So most of them are absolutely shocked that there's capital out there available, hundreds of millions to invest in their club to spruce it up. Like this year, we could be doing 10 projects at your club and you would have no debt and no assessments. Most of the time when I'm on the phone with a board member, they're absolutely shocked. They, they think, geez, I thought the golf industry was in trouble. Tiger Woods being sort of gone from the scene and a lot of negative stories about golf. I had no idea that all your clubs are thriving and growing every year and that we could do this this year and have a complete turnaround in that sort of atmosphere at our club. So I, they don't need to prep. They just need to have somebody tasked on their board with going out and doing a little research and being open to listening and learning. And maybe it's not, not a fit for them. Maybe they have a whole bunch of wealthy members who pony up, pay off their debt, set up a capital reserve, and they're good. Most don't. Mm -hmm. And so they should be talking to someone like us or Club Corp or a local group. Okay, perfect. All right, so this is the last question of the day, the one I ask all of my guests. Peter, I'm sure you've played golf at some amazing places around the country, probably around the world. What's the one club that I and the listeners need to see or need to experience before they die? <laughs> yeah, that's a great one. Uh, I know it's tough when you've got uh, 12 properties yourself, <laughs> and they're probably each, uh, it's like your children. You don't want to say you love one more than the other. <laughs> yeah, I think I'll skip our 12 and say, uh, uh, boy, it's a toss-up. Augusta National, that's a hard one to get on. Sure. That was an incredibly special experience. Or Pine Valley is an outrageous, you know, sort of orgy of golf. Like, if you're <laughs> a golf fanatic like you and I, you got to find some way to get there at some sure. point in life. I've heard a lot of great things about Pine Valley. It's definitely on my list. Well, thanks, Peter. Thanks so much for being on the show, Peter. If people want to find out more about Concert Golf Partners and get in touch with you, how do they go about that? Yeah, best way is just go to our website, which is concertgolfpartners.com. There's a whole page there for member-owned clubs that has a lot of interesting information and a video of board members who've kind of been through this, and they can kind of listen for five minutes uh, or give me a call. Right? Uh, my phone number is right on the website. Yep, you got your cell phone listed right there. You're pretty bold. I don't think I would do that, but <laughs> Peter. Yeah, it does ring quite a bit. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on the show, Peter. No, I love your show, Gabe. Uh, keep up the great work. All right, you have a good one. Thanks, you too. I thought that was pretty eye-opening and a great way to end our April here on Private Club Radio. The month of May is going to be pretty exciting as well. We've got Nick Weir on May 2nd. He's the founder and CEO of Little Owl Entertainment. That's next Monday. We'll be speaking with Nick, discussing all about how to put on big events and really create experiences at your club. On May 9th, Miles Tucker, general manager and COO at Hillcrest Country Club. On May 16th, we will have the duo of Ray Cronin and Russ Condy of Club Benchmarking. On May 23rd, Bill Booth, founder and lead consultant at The Booth Group, to talk all about technology in the private club industry. He's a trend spotter, and I wanted to have him on the show to give you a taste of what's coming in the future. Don't forget to check out this show's website, privateclubradio.com, where you can listen to past episodes, you can see our future guest lineup, and you can apply or recommend someone to be a guest on this show. I made it even easier for you to get this show each and every Monday automatically to download straight to your iPhone or Android phone. If you're an iPhone user, simply go to privateclubradio.com slash iTunes. That's going to take you to the iTunes store. All you have to do there is hit the subscribe button. And each and every Monday, you'll have the leaders of the private club industry educating you right on your phone. And same thing if you're an Android user, simply go to privateclubradio.com slash Android. 
and the same will happen. Until next week, here's to your membership success. Just because this round is over doesn't mean you can't enjoy the 19th hole. Check out privateclubradio.com for more. Private Club Radio is brought to you by Shake Creative, the premier marketing and design firm helping prestigious clubs increase and retain their membership. Visit shaketampa.com to learn more.